My name's Neil Carter, and I'm an orchardist and a bioresource engineer. And I've had the good fortune over the last uh, 30 years to be working in agriculture. So in addition to putting in those long days in the orchard, I've worked in uh, poverty-stricken rural villages and communities, and I really understand the hardship they face in trying to feed their families. I've had fun delivering a broad range, array of projects all over the world, in over 50 countries. Now, in the last 15 years, I've led a project to develop and introduce a biotech crop. And this has certainly been enlightening, and uh, from this I've learned the challenges that one faces. But, uh, you know, I feel strongly that uh, this, this is a technology that needs to be embraced if we're going to feed our planet, and I really feel that education is key to having this happen. It's not going to be easy. Just look at these headlines and you can understand what we're up against. And just to, you know, a couple of comments that I've read, you know, things like, you know, GMOs kill. They always kill and will continue to kill. Or a comment like, um, you know, genetically modified plants have modified DNA. DNA is the difference between a crop being food or a poison. And, you know, these are sorts of things that kind of disturb you when you read it. They're very misleading. And uh, why do people say such a thing? I really feel it's because they've never taken the time to understand biotechnology or agriculture, and it's something that's very personal to them. When you look at a young man like this, you know, you have to realize that biotechnology and biotech crops are already saving lives, and they have potential to save thousands more. Uh, a recent study showed how 480,000 tons of pesticide have been taken out of our production system because farmers globally are growing biotech crops. 480,000 tons, it's a lot. And it's important because in the developing world, about 350,000 people a year die because of pesticide poisoning. So anything that's gonna remove pesticides from our production system in agriculture is a good thing, and I feel people need to embrace that. A tragic photo like this, and we crystallizes the fact that a safe and secure and sustainable food supply is still very much a work in progress and for many on our planet. And you may ask, why do we need ag biotech? You know, I'm happy the way things are. But the real question is, can we afford to not embrace a life-saving technology like agriculture biotechnology? And as Dr. Florence Wambugu in Kenya said, you people in the developing world can afford to debate the merits of genetically modified foods, but can we please eat first? Agriculture is a very conservative business. I'm a farmer myself, and I know this. You know, you have to think long term and be frugal. You have to think a lot about, you know, what crops to grow and how you're going to market them. Yet, agriculture biotechnology is being embraced by more farmers at a fast rate than ever any crop in history, any, any technology in history. And why is this? Because it increases their crop yields, reduces their production costs, uses less water, but more importantly, it improves their lives. Over the last 15 years, $80 billion in improved earnings have flowed to farming families growing biotech crops globally. And these are funds that have flowed, half of that, into the developing world. So these are funds that have flowed into communities and allowed them to invest in their future. For those who don't know much about biotech, ag biotech, first biotech crops came onto the market in 1994. By 1995, we had 35 crops that were approved for production. By 1996, there were 3 million acres in the U.S. alone planted to biotech crops. So this was the most rapidly embraced technology ever. And most of these were commodities like corn, soybean, canola, and cotton. But even with this huge planted areas happening, there were many, many opponents, and people were saying things like, uh, you know, GE crops are being developed so that companies can sell more pesticide. Well, it's completely false, but very inflammatory and causing a lot of concerns for the average consumer. Now, biotech crops and the breeding of, bi of crops using biotechnology 
to offer new solutions not available to traditional breeders. And I think a great example of this is the Hawaiian papaya. In the late 1980s, early 1990s, the Hawaiian pine pineapple or papaya industry was faced with a ring spot virus that threatened the extinction of the industry. It was devastating, as you can see here. A biotech solution was found. Hawaiian papayas became biotech, and business is booming again. So the global area of biotech crops has been increasing very rapidly, and at about 8% per year. It now represents 12% of the total arable land in the world. That's a lot of land. So about 17 million farmers, half in the developing world, have made the conscious decision to plant biotech crops. And this isn't a decision they take lightly. The benefits of this are all around you in affordable cereals and bread and staple crops like that, as well as low-cost cotton for the jeans you wear. We now have a second wave of biotech crops happening. And really, I feel that it's time for opponents to stop referring to biotechnology as a science experiment. You know, many of you have heard of the Human Genome Project. Well, a similar investment is being made right now in the plant genomics. And this investment is allowing us to know plant genetics as, at a, to a remarkable level of detail. And this is leading to us to be able to de develop new crops that meet real-world problems like drought, and saline soils, and poor water quality, and many, many more. It's allowing us to do this while at the same time increasing the yields that's going to help us feed this planet as the population increases to 9 billion by the year 2040. And we're going to have to do that with less farmland than we have now due to urbanization and soil degradation. So this is a huge challenge, and biotech crops are leading the way in allowing us to address it. Right now, we have some of the most exciting innovations in, ever happening in agriculture at our doorstep. Golden rice, fortified with beta carotene, precursor to vitamin A, has the opportunity to save more lives than any crop in history. I worked in Asia, worked in projects with exactly this goal, overcoming, overcoming nutrient deficiencies. But I know we need to embrace this technology because children like these, we have six or 700,000 people under five years of age dying every year because of vitamin A deficiency. So this one trait in golden rice has the opportunity to save, reduce that number, save these people's lives, improve the lives for thousands more, and stave off blindness, as you can see, which is a, one of the, the common traits of vitamin A deficiency. Golden rice isn't an isolated example. Similar work's ongoing in cassava. For those of you who don't know cassava, it's a vital staple crop that feeds about 500 million people, mostly in Africa, most of whom are impoverished and underfed. So new cassava varieties are being developed that are vitamin A enhanced. They have enhanced levels of iron, protein content, plus resistance to pests and diseases. I had the opportunity to work in Africa introducing irrigation for vegetable production during the dry season. And this had a similar goal, diversify the, their diet. And let me tell you, that's not the only solution. That's not the long-term solution. The solution is to develop a robust staple crop like cassava that's drought tolerant, that's pest and disease resistant, and has higher improvement nutritional profile, and biotech has delivered this. So now, you know, the crazy thing is, is that so many people know so little about this technology. They don't know what crops have been genetically engineered, they don't know what traits have been introduced, and they don't know how this work is done. A recent survey showed how 25% of the population has never even heard of biotech crops or genetically modified organisms. You know, it's time for these people to go out there and figure out what's going on and understand it. And I really feel like people in the room here today can help lead that process. When it comes to education, I have a little first-hand experience. In 2011, we did a consumer survey associated with a non-browning Arctic apples. And uh, in the survey, we asked people if they were interested in non-browning apple, and 51% of the people said yes. We then said, well, such a product's available, and it's being developed through genetic engineering, and the, the likelihood to purchase dropped to 49%. But here's the good part. We then told them that all we did was turn off the enzyme that made the apple go brown, and their interest increased to 59%. So what did we learn? We learned just a little information, and the consumers get it, and some of their fear of the technology goes away. With so few 
consumers and folks knowing much about biotech, there's a tremendous opportunity for misinformation to be treated as fact. And let me tell you, there's a proliferation of misinformation out there. The, the consensus is, from the science community and, and credible organizations like this, is that biotechnology is safe. We're eating these crops every day without a single health-related issue. And this has been the case for 15 years. And so why does it keep getting this bum rap? Well, it's a very emotionally charged issue. People are dug in, drawn those lines in the sand. And we need to change that because we need this technology if we're going to feed and sustain our planet and improve our environment. And I think people have to learn to coexist with it and figure out how they're going to do that. A lot of people are opposed to agriculture biotechnology because they feel it's, uh, you know, monkeying around with their food isn't natural. Well, I think uh, it's very much, an imp you know, today people feel that the term natural, they're implying better for you. Well, this is certainly an oversimplification. As you see in these photos here, you know, the wild corn and wild uh, carrots look nothing like what you see in them store today. And uh, we've been monkeying around with our food for a long time. And uh, plant breeders worldwide have been, have been doing this with tremendous benefits to all of us. And so I think you're correct if you make the assumption that none of the food we eat is natural. <laughs> I knew you'd like this one. Um, I think one of the ways people are going to get their head around biotechnology and the value agriculture biotechnology can provide is for them to think of this as a long, one, one advancement, one more progression in a long history of plant breeding that's been going on for 10,000 years. Even as cave dwellers, we were selecting and planting crops best suited to feeding our families. You fast forward to today, we're doing the same thing. The technology is better, vastly improved. Let's face it, you know, genomics, that's pretty, te pretty techy stuff. <clears throat> but that's what's going to allow us to thrive. These benefits, the life-saving benefits in particular, they can't be ignored. Our global population is going up. The land in which we plant crops in is going down. If we can't embrace a technology that allows us to efficiently and sustainably produce the food we need, we're never going to be able to feed this planet and save this planet. So I encourage you to learn about this technology and other innovations that are involved in modern agriculture today. Thank you.